super excited to have an awesome panel here today to discuss the challenges of cultivated meat. Um, we have Mira, Chris, Ron, and John with us. And to get started, I think we can just do a quick round of introductions. I think, uh, John, you already know, but you can still do an introduction. Um, but yeah, let's get started with you, John, and then we'll go around. Uh, John Pattison, co-founder and CEO of Culture Decadence. We are a Wisconsin-based cell cultured meat company working on seafood, specifically lobster. Ron Chigetta, I, uh, I have a little virtual accelerator. I used to be one of the co-founders of IndieBio, and I work with small, ambitious startups. Hello, I'm Chris. I'm the VP of Sales at Future Fields. Um, we make sustainable and cost-efficient growth factors in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Really happy to be here. Thank you so much for organizing this event. It, it feels great to connect as human beings in three dimensions. Um, Mira from New Harvest. So we are a cellular agriculture nonprofit founded in 2004, actually, to support the development of cultured meat. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and so I wanted to start off this conversation with actually taking a look at where we're at with cultured or cultivated meat. Um, so if you look at like the technology adoption, like at a technology adoption life cycle, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but there, sometimes we see this like curve where we have innovators and then the earlier adopters and there's a little bit of a gap before it kind of goes on to like the broader, um, like the broader, like, uh, people looking at it, um, and I just wanted to see where do you think we are right now? Are we still like in the phase where only we're early adopters or now that there's actually tastings happening and people can eat cultured meat and there's a lot of media attention? Are we already seeing like the broader um, world really looking at cultured meat technology? So where really are we on that phase? What do you think? You want to say anything? You're in the game. No? We're all, all right. in the game. All right. We're all in the game. So actually, I, I wrote an essay but in, in preparing this essay about the scaling of the cost of meat. I actually started thinking about automobiles. Because in North America, at one time, there were 400 automobile companies. And I see the expansion of the meat companies very similarly. And you know, I think over the next 10, 15 years, what we're going to see is more of them and then the consolidation. And the game is going to become much more technical now and deeper and deeper. And people think, like, oh, I've got my PhD, I've put, done all this time, and I've done all this work. How much more technical can get? The answer is there is a lot about that. And as we're seeing this week, and as also that um, a lot of the companies only barely understand the food system and the food business as it exists. And we're going to be learning about that. And I think that's what's going to occupy most of us for the next few years. Well, how many people in this room have tried cultured meat? I would say we're all early adopters. Wow, quite a lot. Yeah, that's way more hands than I was expecting. Um, but still not majority, so I don't think that we're at early adopter level yet. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, there's no revenue being generated in the United States from cell cultured meat at all. So nobody has adopted it. Um, there's a lot of promises. Um, and certainly our company is working towards that, and a lot of companies in this room are, but um, we still have to sell a product. Um. I, yeah, I'll just echo that. I, I think we're hyper early adopters. I mean, this is the most likely population to, to be a, an adopter, but um, I think what's, what's more important is the optimism that's being created at this scale of adoption, right? Like, we're so early in the technology curve that you described, but everyone is just looking forward to what's going to happen to the future of food because and and we're at we're less than one percent as paul shapiro was at was getting at right so i don't know we we're still hyper early adopter but i th i think that chasm we will cross it and it, it's going to happen pretty fast i got a question for you two and for all the ceos out there who here would consider opening an office in singapore to get a product out in the shorter term i see two Five. Matt, are we moving to Singapore? <laughs> Put your hand down. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta call my wife. <laughs> Possibly. I mean, would we have to produce in Singapore to sell in Singapore? Probably. So, you know, maybe, but again, it's a very small market. I mean, you're talking about what, five million people? It works so, for somebody. For who? <laughs> 
did it. <laughs> Someone's going to IPO on that. Sure, but I mean, is that a long-term business that's actually well, having you don't an have impact? To do it for me. I mean, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I really don't know the answer to that. Like, is that worth it? That's a personal, very personal question. I think. Yeah. No. I mean, sure. I think ultimately we want to expand everywhere, but um, you know, there's only so much bandwidth, and you really have to think about the business side of it too. Serious question. Will it be the earliest adopters? Right? I'm just for fun, I'm saying. Awesome. But I think so. One thing that I see really clearly is that every year we're hosting the Cultured or the Cultivated Meat Symposium. Um, the industry is getting more and more attention. And I think it's very common for any industry that is growing and gets a lot of attention to receive criticism. So, and I think um, probably a lot of us have seen the counter article a couple of weeks ago from Joe Fassler that was like kind of like taking really the, the technology apart and looking at like how feasible is scalability for this. And it had some interesting points. And I just wanted to talk with you all about how, what do you think about criticism like this? Is this really a, an opportunity for us as an industry to look at that criticism and then really take a step back and look at the broader picture and maybe realign and make sure that we as an industry are on the correct path? Or do you think things like that are really bad for the industry and will destroy us? Yeah, so for people who haven't read it, the counter article compares two pretty radically conflicting techno-economic analyses. So one by GFI, which is pretty optimistic, and then one by a guy named David Humbird, who is less optimistic. Uh, and then the thrust of the counter article really comes, or the criticism in the counter article comes from David Humbird. Uh, he's quoted, I think, as saying, it's a fractal no. But what I want to say is that David Humbird is really like not the pa hater he's been painted out to be. He just wants, he's a provocateur and wants us to think more critically about our technology and have less puffery. So New Harvest did a Reddit AMA a couple of days ago, and one of the first questions was naturally about the counter article. And so, David Humbird made this surprise appearance, and well, I'm just gonna quote him. Um, this is in his words, he says, the Humber TEA is first and foremost a stunt. It's a chemical engineering performance art, a thorough and well-reasoned analysis of an absolutely banana pants idea. The technical issues highlighted within and brought to light by the counter are the products of a well-honed bullshit detector. Sit with them long enough and you can hone one too. Um, which just goes to show, I mean, he's, he's a great guy and he's not a hater. And as Natalie Rubio, one of our fellows says, um, it took a really long time to domesticate animals and it will take a long time to domesticate cells too. I think for our company in particular, we from the beginning knew that price point and scale were gonna be a big issue. And that's why we targeted the species that we did. Um, so if anything, you know, the points that they make are certainly valid, but it probably helps our thesis um, more than anything. Yeah, that's, that's a similar sentiment for us. Like we see it from a supply side and we see, you know, the tremendous infrastructure gap as it extends into the supply chain to produce recombinant proteins, to produce them at absolutely insane scales over these long time spans. Um, so, so that was a, you know, it was a, bonus for us and in our opinion like we we felt good about that it's still that gap is not going away anytime soon um but what you asked was you know are, are we afraid about these criticisms are they damaging to the inch i mean this is a feather in our cap in my opinion uh, when you become important enough that you draw this level of, of scrutiny um, i think it's a good thing and the community just rallied around articulating some great responses to this article I, was it you that was quoted by each other that said they deepen the story um, was was that the was role Jeremiah. that was Jeremiah? I just yeah. thought that, that that was a beautiful summation of, of that article and its impact on the community. Actually, I, I agree. I think that um, there's always going to be people who are not welcoming transparency and not really welcoming public discussion. And I, I'm I'm glad that there's enough of us that are open to it that that we can have that kind of honesty. Um, I think I think I'm going to summarize my experience here at CMS. Like when I read that article and I, and I come here and I see this, I, when I look around the room, I see everybody here has one part about that article they think they know better than the article, right? And they, they're not gonna tell you about it. Most of those, all those stories are hidden secrets, right? 
but what's really encouraging is there's you know, 600 people attending the conference, and everybody's gonna be working on part of that, and that's the power of innovation that none of these people can really predict, but it has worked over and over and over again for all these emerging technologies that, that people have talked about, right? Awesome. One thing that I found interesting in the article was like they had this graphic with like all the timelines and predictions of when cultured meat will be available. And I was wondering, what do you guys think um, after, after we saw that graphic and we saw that usually everybody says like, we're going to have it next year and next year and like in two years and maybe the end of this year. Do you think um, people will now change their way of like making announcements or what do you think is, how should we... Um, going forward, do you think it's a good idea to still say next year? Because I do still, still see people saying next year um, we'll have like a lot of like pilot plans and stuff. Um, but do you th what do you think about that? I'm going to take that one because I also published a blog article that talked about the timeline and the drop of cost over time. And I, I think I think that the early adopters we talked about earlier, they're going to push everybody else, and there will be products in the next 18 months or so coming out they are going to be much more expensive than people would like to pay for a typical piece of meat. But if that is, um, again, I'm going to talk about cars. You know, when the first cars came out, people were like, what's going to happen to all the horses? We don't even have roads like this. People are going to get hurt. These are dangerous machines. All those things were true, right? And no one could imagine the amount of infrastructural change and industrial change in this country that happened afterwards. And it did take 60 years. In 1950, you could cross the country with a car, but there was a section of Route 66 that was several hours long that was a mud track during that time. And so these things, but, but you know what? Dominance comes because it's inevitable because we really need it. Yeah, the, so that graphic you're referring to um, was also my favorite part of the article, and it was a reprint from a recent article from, by Tom Philpott and Mother Jones, I think. And the background behind that like graphic was it was first made by this journalist in 2015 or something in an open um, Google sheet that was turned into this chart. And then it was, it's a timeline of predictions that have, like come and then failed to come true um, by all of us about when cultured meat would come to market. So I think the first prediction was by Jason Matheny, our founder. And so then the second person to update that like public Google sheet was actually Don from Meetable. Um, and then it wasn't updated for a really long time until 2021 when it was updated by Allison, one of our grantees. Um, so it's actually been updated always by people in the industry, like we are our biggest critics. Uh, so I just want to kind of point out that background to the chart. Awesome. Any more opinions about the... I like Ron's auto analogy. Um, and in keeping with that, probably the person most famous for not hitting deadlines but ultimately delivering is in the auto industry, Elon Musk. Um, it hasn't really stopped investment. It hasn't stopped demand. I think uh, cultured meat is going to be along the same lines because there is so much benefit and so much promise. Um, and if we think about this in the long term, you know, if we're saying two years and ends up being five, 50 years from now, who cares? Like that's nothing. Um, but the impact is, is going to last uh, for the rest of the time that we're on this planet. Yeah, I just don't think there's any realistic damage made by, by making a false projection, to be honest. Like, my head is, is long-term time scales of this. Like, um, no, it's not inevitable on a short time scale because it takes a lot of work, but on a long time scale, we're not trying to invent new physics here. This, these are really hard problems we're working on. Um, and, and I put this in a bucket with a, a number of really deep technologies like quantum computing, right? Nuclear fusion. These are all very hard things, but they all have very intelligent people working on it and passionate individuals. And, and over a time span that hopefully matters to our climate, um, that's, that's where I hope we make an impact. So I think it's inevitable. It just matters what time scale you're talking about. I think it might be good to actually talk about how Moore's Law works for a moment. Uh, because that's the curve that we're all talking about. Uh, and meat is falling at a rate faster than Moore's Law did for transistors. But there is no law in them, of course, as we know. But the value drops because the technolo technology just makes log scale differences to price. But at some point, it starts leveling off. 
right? And there's this point where we sort of asymptotically start approaching the real full final cost. That final cost is dictated by the physical laws of biology. And so it's really good for everybody to become sort of familiar with where we think the ultimate pricing is. And I, I'm gonna throw, uh, uh, throw some credit out to UC Davis. They have created a lab-grown meat program there. There are 15 faculty are now doing research. I was lucky enough to go to the poster session for the, for the opening of the program a couple weeks ago. And there was, a, there was one group there that's actually made a lab-grown meat pricing calculator. And you can actually get onto, I'll try to put it onto the Slack. But the, the asymptotic price they predict is $2 a pound. That is basically instantaneous production of meat with zero cost, uh, zero cost growth factors. But it, it shows you that that's, you know, there is room to get down there pretty far. That's awesome. I need to check that out. Um, thanks for sharing. Um, so my next question was really, do you, are you sometimes scared that this industry might fail? Do you, are you like sometimes in the back of your head, do you think like, what if we're doing all this and then actually in 10 years from now, we all failed and we spent like 10 years working on this. And if you do think that, what do you, what are you scared the most? What, is there one thing that you're like thinking like, oh, we really need to like get onto this to actually make it happen? Or is, do you never have any doubt that, do you think like this is definitely going to be the future and we're doing everything right? I think for sure it's the future. I don't know if we're doing everything right all the time, but um, we're certainly pushing it forward um, individually, you know, company to company and uh, nonprofits as well. Um, yeah, I think it's a matter of time and, and making sure that the people that have started in on the industry have the resilience to stick with it even when it does get really tough. Um, and whether that's, you know, funding or science, um, just sticking it out. Uh, I think the idea of a catastrophic failure of an entire industry with this most this much momentum is, is highly unlikely. Um, I get nervous maybe, it, you know, the AI industry would be a good example. So AI is, is an old industry, right? Um, and there was a lot of hype for a long time. And there was a period that was called the AI winter. And, and, and I don't remember exactly when that was. I'm aware of it. But, but what happened afterwards is obvious now. AI is, is embedded in every facet of our lives and even in the companies that we're building. Um, so sure, it, it may be possible that we run into some challenges, that it's just it's slow to put materials together and transmute them into different form factors on, at some certain time scale. But I think, I think it's going to happen. Um, and there might be some bumps along the road. But I don't think a catastrophic failure of cell is, is a thing. Actually, one of, maybe the one fear that I have sometimes is all these companies working towards this and pushing to commercialize and, you know, if there isn't a lot of self-regulation and, and safety and oversight from that standpoint, maybe somebody's pushing ahead too quick and is going to leave a bad impression for the rest of the consumer base um, that isn't actually reflective of how other companies are operating or what, how their products are made. Um, so that would be probably one concern that I have. No, I would just echo John. I think rushing to market is probably the biggest risk of failure. Like if there's some huge safety catastrophe that could affect future investment, future public funding, willingness of people to enter the field. So I, I don't think that there's a huge rush and that we can really take our time. Great, thanks for, for sharing. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely, I, I really love this community so much. And I think like all the people that I meet that are working on Cultured Meat, just everyone is just awesome. And I really do think that this, like all the people in this room, like I think everyone is going to make it happen. So I am really excited to work with all the people and like all the conversations I have, like it's just, I feel like everyone is so dedicated. I've never experienced that ever before in my life to just have like, such a room full of people where everybody's just like working so hard and so dedicated to this and making it happen. So it's super exciting to be in this space. Actually, I want to respond to something Mira said. Like, actually, I have a slightly different point of view, and that is most of you should not be sleeping nights. And I think that, that that's one of the reasons 
that actually things move forward. So I, have a, I hope it's not too long a story, but I met this economist at, at a meeting like this, and his, he has a Wikipedia page that's very long. He's very, rep, like his car came to pick him up after the meeting we were talking while I was waiting for his car. And you know, I said, well, what do you think about food prices? Because they seem to be rising now, which is a big deal for other unrelated reasons. And he said, food prices are not gonna fall. They're, I mean, they're gonna keep falling. It's just gonna keep happening. I thought like, why isn't he worried about it? Because it's a real problem. And then I realized afterwards while reading his Wikipedia, he was like, he's an economist. What he sees is that over the past 100 years, innovations have shown up and technology has come up, and he studies innovation, entrepreneurship, and technology, right? It's so like clockwork. These things show up and food price drops. The Haber process, like the Green Revolution, and now this, right? But in each of those revolutions, there are people who are not sleeping. They are treating it like their life's mission, and they've put everything they have into it. And that he's sitting up there, steering the boat, watching the boat move, but down there in the end room, there's all these people working away. And that's really what makes it work. Everybody has tough times, and you will have tough times. When you do, you have to remember that, that is actually the fuel for everything that's happening, and that there's a purpose to it. And uh, maybe it hasn't come for all of us yet, but I do want to encourage you to sort of sit through that and just remember how important that is. OK, work hard, but sleep, because it's a long burn and a long game. I feel like it. <laughs> um, well, I, I will continue Productivity to is important. Don't yeah. yourself. But I sometimes. definitely didn't get a lot of sleep over the last week. <laughs> 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 okay, to shift gears a little bit, um, I wanted to address like one uh, topic that I was thinking about. So we do have some some early companies or some early players in the space that have gotten a lot of attention and traction, and they are growing rapidly. Like some companies have like over a hundred, like multiple hundred employees at this point, and but still we do also see a lot of new companies, um, pretty much join the field, like, it seems like pretty much on a weekly basis almost. And I was just wondering, what do you see are, like, challenges for everybody who's kind of starting now to be, like, in that second wave of, of, of groups starting? I think there was, um, Matt, you reminded me of this. I think there was, a, there was an investor panel at ICBM, um, and, and they said, alluding to differentiation being a, being a main factor of the so-called second wave companies, right? But what was interesting is they said um, not being geographically co-located is, is a huge advantage, right? So, you know, these, these first movers in South Africa, these first movers in individual countries, like if, if there are more second wave companies in disparate geographic locations, I think that's, that's a unique advantage. And then if you are co-located, that's when actual product differentiation starts, I believe, starts to matter more. Um, and there's, of course, tons of innovation to happen. Like, we haven't even scratched the surface of, of I don't know, culturing, like, co-culturing different species together. There, there's so much work to be done, and there's so much room to differentiate, even within the same geographies. Yeah, I think we're, I guess, considered part of that second wave, um, although very much the first wave for, for lobsters and lobsters in North America. Um, and they don't even deal with waves. They're way under the waves. So <laughs> the pun or analogy is not working. Um, I think for us, you know, fundraising is, is interesting. The investor base is getting smarter every year, every month. Um, the milestones that uh, investors want to see are, are different than they were six months ago, 12 months ago, uh, two years ago. I think for us, because of what we're working on is fairly differentiated, it's communicating that um, in a way that makes sense for them, but also respects the challenges that we have. Um, I think the other thing, too, is that there are so many companies right now. There's so much money that has been poured out here. You know, our measure for success should be product revenue and environmental impact, not fundraising and how many headcount you have, right? Like, there's plenty of examples of companies that have raised hundreds of millions or billions of dollars and there's nothing there, right? Um, so making sure that internally, you know, we don't get distracted by that. We are focused on the science. We are focused on making an impact and pushing that forward, I think, is really important. 
Yeah, I think, Ron, you, you advise a lot of startups. So I think, what would you tell yeah. somebody who's starting? There are some repercussions to the stage and where everything is. And so, I, actually, I'd like to, yeah, so I mentioned before, I think that the newer companies have to be more technically driven. They have to be more technically advanced. Like, literally, some of the earliest companies, they were a couple guys in front of a hood, and sometimes we're still having that. That's okay. And girls, too. But, like, but... There is going to be some catching up you have to do. And so there is a lot of technology out there to sort of move things higher throughput, to be looking at much more deeper sort of technical plans, to, to start looking at the biology of the cell and start to look sort of like for the advantages that are not on the surface. And I think that's what we're going to see a lot of. And a company that can succeed that in, at that will have an advantage over some of the first wave companies. So you have to find a strategy that will literally insert you into, into, into the play now. Um, and a lot of that is going to have to do with economics. So I will just be, I will name names, like the doubling time is too long, right? Uh, the media costs, it's not just the media costs, but the throughput use of the media and the efficiency of the use of the media. Um, those, and, and obviously if there's a limit of doubling, that's always a problem. Those are sophisticated problems, but if you look at the models, there's no way that we can actually achieve the desirable price points without tackling them, and, and they're still pretty open, I think. Great, yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, also a lot of times we hear that analogy for um, the San Francisco gold rush, that those who were making the, the picks and axes really were the ones who made the most money. Um, do you think this is something that we might also see in the cultured meat industry, those who are like providing the technology and working on different uh, yeah, technological aspects will really be the big winners in the end? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm biased to have an opinion on that, right? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Like, it's still relatively small and, and still early, right? It, yes, I, I do think picks and shovels companies are really important. The biotech picks, picks and shovels companies, um, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. Like, we, in fact, we pivoted our entire business model very early on when I didn't even join the team. We were producing meat. Um, and we said, no, actually, this is the best way for us to make an impact for this industry. Let's Let's lift the whole boat, right? Um, rising tides, sorry. Um, so yes, I, I, I think there's a lot of money to be made doing picks and shovels, but, but the challenge with that, obviously, is, is being a new company and, and establishing yourself, establishing credibility and, and building yourself up, right? And showing that your products do what you say they will do. Um, there can only be so many picks and shovels companies, and eventually you have to mine the mountain, right? <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a, probably a pretty personal decision and uh, conversation with your team and, and what you think you're good at, what you think your core competencies are, and is that actually going to have a lasting impact on the industry and, and doing that. So whether that's being a meat producer or picks and shovels, growth factors, um, you know, not everybody can do everything. So. Uh, understanding where you are, what you want to do, and what you're good at, and what the world needs is, is really important to them. Yeah, and I, I think, so, I think in the early days, I, um, I had the feeling that a lot of the companies were actually trying to do everything themselves. Like, I heard people saying, oh, yeah, growth factors, we got to figure it out, media, we got to figure it out, scaffolds, we got to figure it out, right? We got everything figured out. So now I feel like, what do you think? Is it changing? Like, are we seeing that our companies that are, like, our companies open to, like, collaborate and saying, like, hey, if you're going to make the scaffolds, actually, that would be awesome. And if you provide the media, we'll, we'll be happy. Like, we don't want to do it ourselves anymore. Do we... Do, do we see any change of that over the last couple of years? And how do you predict that will look like in the next couple of years that are to come? I mean, I, I think as as the B2B side becomes more and more established, then that technology infrastructure becomes more accessible and, and understood, then that's going to enable second wave, third wave, et cetera, companies to continuously start over and over and over again because there's we're slowly collectively building a playbook for, for making a, a cell -like company and, and we're part of, we believe, part of that playbook, right? A, a critical part, the growth factor part. Um, but yeah, I, I just, this 
it's getting easier for people who just have raw passion and, and can't necessarily connect to the technical side of, 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 of growing cells in the hood to, to actually get after an idea, form a team, plug and play all these different technology partners together and, and, and build the semblance of a really good company. So I don't know. I think we're making it easier. Yeah. I'll try to keep it brief, though. I mean, like, I, I think it's also important to understand that um, if you look at the cost of actually developing everything in-house, these rounds are really big, aren't they? But they are nowhere near enough money to build your own plant, right? If you think, oh, someone so raised $50 million or $100 million, that's great. But that plant, if you really design it from scratch and you hire all the engineers to do it and all the consultants, most of that round's gone. And so when you start parsing it out, you've got to work with some of the specialty players, right? Already we're seeing acquisitions from scaffold, of scaffolding companies, of cell line companies. And so there is a great opportunity there. But, but fundamentally, everybody's got to look at and say, what is the kernel of my value? What is the one thing I'm doing that's mine that I do better than other people and I get that cheaper? than everybody else does. That's what makes you desirable, and you always have to have that at your core. Awesome, and I think we have time for one more question um, before we open up to audience uh, questions. Um, and I think, so I was going to ask Mira, so a new harvest I think has a really great, um, kind of like a bird view perspective, I think of the entire industry. So you really are connected to everyone, um, industry and academia, and like you really like are working um, from like a broader community perspective. So I was wondering, what do you see can we really do? And I, I really love the thing that Kim talked about, the. Um, the big uh, effort that you did on like risks where we, you got people to work together without even signing NDAs and I think that's really awesome and I was wondering what do you see our opportunities to do more of those things in the future and how can really the industry come together and really work on, on challenges that there might still be without like being scared people are gonna steal each other's ideas or, or like yeah, be scared that they're gonna share too much knowledge. Like how do you see, can we all benefit from, from that? Yeah, the field is really at an inflection point. Like for the longest time, I mentioned we've been around since 2004 and like the first or the last decade or so has been spent like really building the basic, basic infrastructure for the field. And I feel like we're now at an inflection point where there can be good actors, there can be bad actors. Um, it's not so speculative. And so the time is really now for standard setting and to figure out how to minimize bad actors and make sure that we all are really truly making sure cultured meat does deliver on its promises to make the world a better place because it won't necessarily do that, um, but we can work together to make that happen. So the safety initiative was definitely the first in many initiatives we have planned to make sure CELAG maximizes its positive impact on the world. Awesome, and before we open up one just from each of you, it would be great if you could uh, say one thing that you're hoping that will happen in the industry until um, CMS 22. So is there one thing that you're most excited about or what you would like to see until we meet again in a, a year? Commercialization in the US and like accessible. So it's not just, you know, private tastings at a select restaurant like where I could come in and buy it. Um, I would, I'd love to see that. I want to see a lobster roll. <laughs> Come to Madison. I'm there. Yeah, I, I, I want to see the, the regulatory floodgates open up in the US. I, I think that's huge. Once that's unlocked, that this is just going to unleash a tsunami, I believe. I want to sell cultured crunch wrap at Taco Bell. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Yeah, and you, if you have not went to mirrors. Taco Bell yet and got the mirror box, I highly <laughs> suggest you do. <laughs> awesome, so I think we have time for some audience questions. So yeah, please, if you have any questions, feel free to line up on the microphone stand over there and we can take some questions. Awesome, uh, great conversation, guys. I'm Tim from Merck and uh, really enjoyed the, the open dialogue. I, th I think that's very important. 
Um, going back to Ron's point, you know, what keeps you up at night or staying up all night, all I think about is cell culture media and, and how do we figure out and bring solutions to, you know, the folks that are in the room. And I guess my question um, comes back to some of the dialogue that you guys had on, hey, look, culture meat and seafood companies are realizing, you know, we don't have to be good at everything. You know, what we're trying to do at the end of the day is be really good at making an awesome cultured meat or seafood product. It does not say that we have to be very good at cell culture media, scaffolds, the bioreactors, everything in between. Right? So my, my question is, what parts of the value chain do you think cultured meat and seafood companies are going to start getting more laxed on? Or maybe a, a question to John, you know, a year ago, you might have said, hey, we have to tackle all these things and we're going to try to do it maybe ourselves. And maybe by now you're saying, all right, you know, we're not going to be the best at this part of the process. So what are we open to uh, collaborating with others? Yeah, I think. Uh we actually had a line item in our milestones that was CRO, CRO partnerships because we we're fully aware that it doesn't make sense for us to try to do everything. Um, you know, I think where we're at right now, like there just hasn't been a lot of basic research on crustaceans, on lobsters, and so we're doing that, but we're also trying to partner and leverage relationships in existing industry, academia, um, to shortcut, you know, if that's a week or two weeks or a month, you know, in the life of a startup, that's, that's meaningful, that's material. Um, I think uh, as we learn more on, on the cell lines and kind of get to a point on the media um, and on scaffoldings and other downstream things, like, then we can actually have meaningful partnerships and meaningful relationships. Um, and some of those we are further along and some of those we're not. Um, but I think eventually, you know, we'll get there, the industry is gonna specialize more, both from the startup standpoint, but from the existing uh, contractor standpoint, uh, whether it's Merck, you know, working on media, or other companies kind of pivoting into um, making cell culture a revenue stream for them. Uh, I think it's just gonna help everybody long term. Hello guys, uh, my name is Javier. I'm from the Thunderbird School of Global Management in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, so given how polarized things are here in the United States, we have a lot of anti-science, uh, people don't believe in climate change, they won't get the vaccine. Um, how are you guys addressing the um, communication in science? Like, how are you guys going to build equity in science and um, build trust with consumers with cultured meat? And what kind of talent are you looking for going forward to um, kind of address, like, all of the issues that, that people have, especially consumers in, in parts of the country with low science literacy? Um, well, on the communication side of thing, I think that this field at large has this kind of trauma response to what happened with GMOs. Um, and the way we talk about it is that how consumers were really anti-science about GMOs, but I don't think that's actually the case. What happened is that Monsanto was like a giant asshole and weaponize their technology to screw over small farmers. Um, and that's what the like general public was responding to. They were responding to Monsanto weaponizing their technology and being an asshole. So what we can do is not do that. But I, I think that we should be far more generous um, with people. I think that people are far more open to eating interesting new things um, and are not really anti-science, they're anti-assholes. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Holden and I'm a student at Oregon State University. Um, a lot of people my age are passionate about the climate crisis and looking to make a change in the world. Um, what do you think, or who do you think holds a degree of responsibility about getting the word of this industry for like talent out there? Because obviously the CMS team is writing a children's book and there are very capable PhDs and CEOs in this room, but who holds the push to get maybe high schoolers engaged in some kind of field that would help them in cultured meat companies or something like that? I think in some part, certainly the nonprofits have a role in that, and I think they, they do a really good job. Um, I know New Harvest has 
do you have high school interns or? Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, okay. Um, you know, we give kind of ad hoc tours to even preschoolers and grade schoolers sometimes um, of our lab. But yeah, so it's on the nonprofits and on the companies themselves um, to create opportunities, whether it's like internships or I don't know, field days, whatever it might be. Um, and then also partnering with universities. So we have a really great relationship with the University of Wisconsin um, and their biotechnology training program where you have PhD level students who maybe don't want to go into academia, but they want exposure to a startup or to industry. And so uh, we work with them to give them internships and exposure. Um, but some of it is just, there's so much to do as a startup, you know, you really have to focus and uh, when we can, we do. And I think that's probably the same for other companies in the space. I think there's a real lack of talent, right? You, you'd like to have more help, I think, on the deep technical side, right? I mean, I think that's generally true. I don't, I think there are like plenty of skilled. Good techs? No. I think there's plenty of, I mean, no, I, I disagree. I think that there's a lot of good talent. It's, at least from what I've seen, a lot of scientists are very risk adverse, you know? Mm. And so it can take more traction or a lot more money. So they're there, <laughs> to, but they don't come in. Well, I or, think that, you know, if you're going to dedicate your life to something, you want to have a pretty good idea that you're either super mission aligned or that it's really going to work and you're going to have a lasting impact. Right. Um, and some of that is signaling from VCs and the investment dollars, but um, it's also tough sometimes to, you know, get people to fully buy into something if you can't share everything that you're doing, you know, before they can't talk about that. Right. <laughs> I can't tell you what you're going to do here. Uh, well, I just want to say <laughs> one thing really quick. That, like, I actually work at uh, work with Laney College, which is a community college in Oakland, and we just can't get enough students in at that age. I mean, the the coolness of cellular biology is not very high in the high school level, and I, I don't know how to work on that, but it's a real problem. There's empty slots needed to be filled. I, I mean, what what role to play? I think. When you have capacity and bandwidth, engage with internships as much as possible. Um, as a, for reference, I used to work at a university and I used to manage an innovation studio, which is for students doing very interesting things. Um, and there, there's, there's just a social effect that happens when you find out that Jill got this amazing internship at this company, which is involved in this weird industry called cellular agriculture, and it just spreads like wildfire across the university. So, um, you know, whenever you can, please engage with internship programs because it, it's a forcing function for developing talent in your city. Um, and I disagree on the lack of talent. There's tons of talent in Canada, by the way. <laughs> Hello again. We have time for uh, one more or two more questions. Oh, I see three people. Maybe we can get through all. Hello again. Uh, Evan Koss from St. Joseph's University. And with, as we get closer to commercialization, we see old school meat companies, Tyson, Cargill, Purdue, Hormel, investing in this space. And maybe from your guys' perspective, is, are you hopeful that they will embrace the technology or is it more death to the old guard, all hail the new kings? So I, I want to say that food is different. One of the reasons we're here is because food is different than other things. Like if, you were, like if you're trying to disrupt taxis, it's very different. Hotels, it's very different. Food is a, demo, a relatively democratic market. They cannot stop you from putting your product on the market because it's just too distributed with too many different entities. And so these guys are well equipped to get interested, get involved, and acquire. And that's what they're, that's what they're positioned to do. It's different than like a petroleum company that's squashing a biofuels company. And that's one of the reasons I'm still in this and I love it. Um, I kind of do think like death to the old guard. It, there's this profound injustice to the people that created the messed up situation that we're in in the first place to now absorb and profit from the technology that's solving like their mess. But of course, like there's very limited funding, especially when the government is not funding this much at all. Um, you have to take money, so, but you also don't want to like make deals with the devil. So I, I mean, I'm fortunately in a position where I don't have to get like investment money. Um, but 
I, I do think that there's just this like profound injustice to it all, and I, I don't, like they are demonstrated bad actors. They've done a lot of bad things, and I think that they should be punished for that. Thank you. Hello, Patricia from Or Billion here. Um, I wanted to add a little bit and, and to the question regarding talent because I actually think there is a lack of talent, uh, especially in bioprocessing, that we see and that affects our field a lot and other fields too. We see cell therapies gaining more importance. We see biopharma due to COVID having an increased uptick in, in demand on this talent. And a good bioprocess engineer just doesn't grow overnight and definitely comes after high school. This takes years and decades to learn this. This is hard. And in this industry, we need more people come over with that experience to help us. Because it's great to see a bunch of young talent in there that has the vision to do this. But we need people that have the experience to build this field to make sure that the products that we build and the processes we build are safe, are stable, and are optimized. So. I think it will be important and the winners will be the companies that can convince the people that have the experience to come to this field. And for that, I think we all need to grow up a little bit more. Just a comment and maybe you have some comments back on that. Anyone has any comments back? It's impossible to hire a senior bioprocess bio engineer. Because if you do hire them, they usually come from pharma, which is really expensive. Like those guys don't know how to make a three dollar pound product. They're they're making thirty thousand dollar pound product. So it's a, there's a lot of learning even for experienced people. That's a very particular role, but uh, I think there's also other roles that are going to be rare in some cases. But some things, yeah, you can find a lot of people. It's true. For roles like that, do you think that the skills that they have from those owners in other industries are transferable? Or they have to learn on the job. Yeah, there's there's. There are no people who've ever made a meat, and it's a, it's a weird hybrid between a medical product and a white biotech product, so there's a lot of recombinant protein being made by the ton. Uh, and those people are some of the best people, but they are super, I mean, those people can get a job anywhere, anytime. And so maybe later on in later stages, the companies will start running into that. I mean, you can see Amy who spoke in the, in the opening session, she had 14 years at PepsiCo or something like that. Like, those people are who you want later stage when you're actually doing big money stuff, and that's that's probably more of the thing we're talking about, or I'm talking about. Yeah, I think it's on us to prove that this is going to happen, and then we can attract that high talent, and we can pay them the money that they deserve. They're out there. We're just not there yet. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the biggest thing you can do is just appeal to meaningful work and purposeful work. Um, and like, we have a very experienced protein purification person. She came from a Nobel Prize winning lab. And, and she comes in every day and she just loves it. Could she be commanding a, a higher wage somewhere else? Absolutely. Um, she knows we're a startup, but she comes into work invigorated every day. She knows what we're trying to do. She knows what the mission is. Um, so yeah, I agree. It, it's, it's probably way more challenging to get the senior expertise and that m might be where mission and vision and, and purpose and meaning matters a lot more. Um, rather than just we have a, a better compensation package. So. Great. I think we can squeeze in one more question. Thanks. Hi, guys. Matt, Future Fields, Chris's boss. Um, <laughs> it's a plan. Get back to work. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of a question for Mira, but I guess, you know, be curious to open it up to everyone. Um, you know, what do you see as, as the nonprofit's role in supporting private companies in this industry. I know, you know, New Harvest is your, I don't, I don't know the exact wording, but your, your mission is about maximizing the impact of cell ag. And, you know, cell ag is an industry that's all private companies. And I think the reason it's accelerated so fast is because of all the private capital that's been dumped into it. So, you know, the, the biggest impact probably is through supporting those companies that have the best chance. But at the same time, you need to be seen as neutral um, so I'm just curious, you know, what's New Harvest's position on that right now? Do you see a future where you guys would be supporting individual companies? Um, and yeah, to the rest of the panel, like, curious thoughts on on how that could impact the industry, and if nonprofits should start looking at doing that. 
Good question. Um, in terms of how we can support companies, I think that, well, there are things like our safety initiative, which Kim talked about before. Um, but beyond that, New Harvest and other nonprofits are in a really unique position to where, like in terms of when, when, all, when companies are trying to educate consumers, they're really marketing. Ultimately, you're peddling a product and consumers are and should be like a little bit distrustful of what you're saying because you're eventually trying to sell them something. Whereas a nonprofit like New Harvest, we're never trying to sell anything. So we're in a really unique position to truly like educate and compassionately educate people about the technology because we're not marketing. We're, we're really just about getting like true, accurate knowledge out there. So I think that's one of the biggest ways that we can support companies and companies can support us um, financially and we can do that stuff. Yeah, I think, um, so there's a lot of answers to this question in my head right now, but um, so I'm a board member of New Harvest. I'm in this industry because of New Harvest. Um, they were my first contact in this space. I still remember having coffee with Isha in, in Brooklyn like three or four years ago now. Um, I think that their role is really important, whether it's New Harvest or GFI or any of these other ones that are popping up or exist to create that ecosystem, create those opportunities for interaction, whether it's on the hiring side, the recruiting side, um, the safety side, regulatory side, commercialization side, like create those communities. Um, we've benefited directly from that in making connections with consultants or CROs or whoever it might be. Um, so I think that's really important. And I would say, if you wanna see the impact that nonprofits can have, the I think it's the annual report from this year, last year, the spider chart with all the different companies. Yeah, yeah. take a look at that. It's amazing um, to just see the impact of a relatively small nonprofit. You know, there's a few people, you know, a couple million dollars, and you're literally creating billions of dollars in VC and hundreds or not thousands of jobs at this point. Great, and I think with that, uh, we will have to wrap up our panel, but I would like to thank you all for, for this discussion. Um, and yeah, please give a round of applause to Mira, Ron, Chris, and John. Thank you so much.